This class is on trade, and trade and freedom is the is the theme of what I'm going to have to say. Uh, the link between uh, trade and freedom. And uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you are familiar with a, an essay called I Pencil? Just about everybody. Okay. Okay. Cause that's, I won't I won't spend much time on, on that then. Sometimes uh, not too many students are. And. Uh, you know, most of you have, all of you have taken an, an economics course or two, or, or a lot of economics courses, have seen the, the case for free trade uh, uh, in, in various forms. Um, I mean, it can be explained very simply and straightforwardly, or in a very confused and convoluted way with Edgeworth boxes and everything. Uh, that's what uh, the uh, textbooks do. They make it as hard as possible for you to understand what the heck is. Uh, is the benefit of free trade. But uh, the case for free trade is no different than the case for all trade. It's mutually advantageous exchange is uh, is beneficial to the, to the trading partners. And, and it creates value. That's how value is created. And, uh, and, of course, there are other elements of it that you've all learned about. Um, just the straight economics of it is um, one of the famous passages of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations is uh, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. There's a whole section in the Wealth of Nations called uh, that, under that title. And uh, what he observed back in 1776 when this book was written is that uh, there are economies of scale involved in trade. Uh, if, if you expand the market for your product, um, there, are, there are no graphs in the Wealth of Nations but uh, Adam Smith certainly understood the relationship between long-run average cost, and here's a quantity of output and cost up here. He understood the concept of economies of scale because he observed that at large-scale production, mass production, led to lower cost. Uh, in the Wealth of Nations, there's a famous uh, passage about a, a pin factory and a woolen coat factory and how he observed that with mass production, uh, they could produce... Uh, you know, orders of magnitude, more pins and coats uh, in the same amount of time and the, uh, the same resources be, because of uh, specialization in mass production. And so uh, if you have a small market, uh, only 10 customers, well, you're going to have a higher cost. You'll have the long run average cost here. But if you expand through trade, you, you load up your ship in England and sail across the ocean and have the, you have the, the English market as well as the American market, uh, that gives you the opportunity to have a much lower cost. Uh, and so, so and that's, that's basically what Adam Smith was talking about when he said that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. The bigger the extent of the market, uh, the more division of labor you're going to see, and therefore lower, lower, lower um, cost per unit. And that's one of, that's one of the most important um, aspects of uh, the economics of trade, uh, I think, that people don't really understand. And um, and so, and of course, vice versa. Restrictions on trade uh, make it more costly for everybody to, to buy goods and services because the, the goods uh, the goods are, uh, are higher cost uh, production. And um, uh, but another angle of this, another angle of uh, looking at trade, is uh, if you look at what Murray, people like Murray Rothbard have said about it and Ludwig von Mises, um, it, Rothbard has a very eloquent statement about trade and the economy. And here's, I'll read it to you. Some of you may have seen this. He says, the economy is one vast lattice work uh, throughout the world in which each individual, each region, each country produces what he or it is best at most relatively efficient in and exchanges that product for the goods and services of others. Without the division of labor and the trade based upon that division, the entire world would starve. Coerced restraints on trade, such as protectionism, cripple, hobble, and destroy trade, the source of life and prosperity. So uh, so when Murray Rothbard made the case for free trade, he didn't, didn't just discuss economies of scale, and, and, and uh, how trade is mutually advantageous. It's, it's really the whole source of civilization. And uh, wh what do governments do, by the way, when a, uh, typically, not every single time, but typically when they're at war with another country with regard to trade? What, historically, what, what do governments do when they're at war with another country? What's that? They, they, they try to embargo is, or... Uh, uh, you know, they surround the country and don't let any ships come in to, to import goods. They try to starve them out and destroy their economy. 
through trade. You know, the American Civil War, there was a blockade of the southern ports. Uh, World War II, they were constantly trying to blockade all the countries uh, that had ports uh, that were involved in it, were trying to blockade each other to, to interfere with commerce. And so obviously, you know, all throughout history, uh, everybody understood that the surest way to destroy a, a nation's economy and, to, and its civilization is to, is to cut off its trade. That's why what protectionism does is uh, when a country adopts a policy of protectionism, it does to itself in peacetime what its enemies want to do to it in wartime, <laughs> to destroy its own, its own economy. And all for the benefit of a very tiny group of influential, politically influ- influential people who uh, don't want to compete. Uh, uh, and so that's basically what it is. And so those of you, I, I asked if you read I Pencil. Well, that's really the lesson of international trade. If you, the, the, uh, there might be, there a few of you who have never read I Pencil, you can go online at fee.org and read it. The uh, Foundation for Economic Education has a nice little, uh, even that little hard copy of I Pencil is such a good one. I, I actually, uh, when I teach undergraduate classes, that's the first day of class, I always hand out I Pencil to everybody, uh, no matter what the class is. Because I think every anybody who studies economics uh, ought to start with that with that essay, because it explains it explains a story that's told by a pencil, uh, who describes all of his ingredients, and there are many dozens of ingredients. And when you think about it, you know, no human being or no, or no group of humans like all of us in this room could possibly produce a pencil. It just isn't possible. You know, you'd have to have you'd have to have a forest and cut down trees with timber. You'd have to have a lead mine for the lead. You'd have to have a rubber plantation for the little erasers. And and, and if you think of all the people involved in all these things, it involves uh, probably thousands of people from all over the world cooperating to do what? Well, to give us pencils. Uh, and so, and the main lesson of that is uh, the invisible hand of Adam Smith. How people uh, motivated by their own self-interest will be driven to cooperate with others all around the world uh, for their mutual benefit. But also the international trade point is sometimes lost in this, in that uh, it is people all around the world cooperating to, to produce the most mundane things, pencils, bread, uh, you know, beer, whatever you want to, what do you want to call it? Okay. And another point about trade that you don't really get in the economics books is that uh, you know, the more we damage international trade, this lattice work, as uh, Murray Rothbard called it, uh, the poorer we are, and, and the more people in in the country will be dependent on the state. So more and more people will become dependent or wards of the state uh, as we have more poverty as a result of the diminished trade. And that's usually not a, a desirable outcome. Some people think it is. But I certainly don't. And uh, Mises had a nice way of putting it. He says, uh, trade weaves the bond which unites men into society. You know, uh, in the, this was back in the days when they didn't u- include women when they talked about uh, society. <laughs> the, old, the old time, you don't see this kind of talk much anymore. But he meant everybody, of course. Uh, and he says, in the, and also, man serves in order to be served. That's because of... That's, that's really an eloquent statement of the case for for trade, the case for capitalism, really. Uh, as my my old friend Walter Williams, the columnist in the in the in George Mason, uh, he has a nice way of putting it. He calls dollars when he, when he gives a talk about this. He'll pick a currency, he'll pick some fiat currency out of his out of his pocket and uh, and, uh, and call it uh, certificates of performance. And it, it proves that you've provided a service to somebody, uh, which they voluntarily gave you in return money, you know, do- dollars, these certificates of performance. And that's what Mises is talking about here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another aspect of the case for trade that you don't usually find in a typical economics book is uh, a point that Friedrich Bastiat was was uh, very famous for, and. Just about everybody here, or most everybody here, knows something about Bastiat, French economic journalist, I guess you'd call him, uh, who wrote a lot in the uh, in the, the late 1840s. I think I think the year of his death was 1850. And uh, but uh, one of the uh, points that he made in his writings, especially his his great essay, The Law. How many people have read The Law? It's yes, sort of most of you. Those of you who haven't, you should read it. Uh, sometime today. 
<laughs> it's a great, it's a great, it's a great essay. Uh, uh, you know, that and I pencil. Uh, anybody would go a long way toward understanding political economy. If I were, to, if anybody ever asked me, what can I give high school kids to start learning something about economics? It's I pencil economics in one lesson by Henry Hazlitt and the law by Friedrich Bastiat. That's a, that's a case any of you are in, interested in, the, in that sort of thing. But one of the things um, points Bastiat makes is that uh, you know what is traded when you trade, whether it's international trade or domestic trade, is property titles. Here's, you know, if I give you, if I sell you something, uh, it doesn't necessarily come with a, a written title, but that's what we're trading property rights, really, when we, the right to own property, when we buy and sell things. And so he looked at um, protectionism as an attack on private property, not just uh, something that might impoverish people. And he, he, uh, he lived on a, a coastal area of France. And when France adopted protectionism, he saw the effects firsthand of protectionism. It destroyed his hometown economically. It began impoverished his hometown because the port dried up uh, because of trade restrictions. And so, uh, and so, uh, so the, he saw it as an attack on private property. And if you read uh, Bastiat's writings, he equated protectionism with communism. He thought communism is essentially the same thing because. Uh, you know, what is communism after all? If you, if you ever read the Communist Manifesto, there are a few parts in there where, uh, Marx and Engels have big, big fat black letters to emphasize what, what they, and, and one of these parts of the Communist Manifesto is abolition of private property. That's like the whole key to the Communist Manifesto. And, uh, abolition of the family too, it was highlighted in the, in the Communist Manifesto. And, uh, and Bastiat understood that, well that's, pretty much the same thing as protectionism. It's not the complete abolition, but it's an attack or an assault on private property. And he thought that this was one step toward the abolition of private property, uh, interferences like this, trade restrictions, and, and everything else that would come you know, after, different types of regulations on your ability to use your own property. And so in his writings, he calls it the same thing. Now, um, to put a little, little more history onto this, um, on the eve of the French Revolution... Uh, Mises points out that a lot of writers and, and philosophers and economists, commentators at the time, uh, there was no such thing call, as an economist per se, but Adam Smith was a moral philosopher, uh, but he wrote on economics. Uh, there were, the thinking was that democracy would put an end to war. Democracy put an end to war. And of course it didn't quite work out that way. The way, the way Mises put it, is that, okay, they had the French Revolution, they adopted democracy, and everyone said, this is going to put an end to war. We've got democracy now. So these were the the early neocons. That's that's, that's their creed, isn't it? Democracies don't war against each other. That's their whole, what they believe in. It's what motivates them. But, But here's what Mises points this out. Under the leadership of Napoleon, the French adopted the most, most ruthless methods of boundless expansion and annexation. So it didn't quite work out that way. They had democracy, and then they got Napoleon to try to conquer the planet afterwards. And, and so, uh, and so what, what classical liberals have always uh, uh, understood or maybe noticed is that uh, free trade uh, is also a powerful deterrent to war because if the trading partners are are thriving, prospering by cooperating with one another, why would they want to kill the, the goose that lay, that's laying the golden egg, so to speak, and then and, and kill off your trading partner? If, if because of that person you're buying and selling and you're both becoming wealthier year by year, why would you want to ruin all that? Um, and it's basically the, the, the saying. Uh, and uh, the Bastiat popular, popularized an old saying that if goods can't cross borders, armies will. That's how they talked about this in Bastiat's day. If goods can't cross borders, armies will. Uh, <clears throat> because back in the, back in that time, uh, it's hard to relate to it now because America is such a prosperous place. But, um, um, trade restrictions could really cause severe poverty and starvation, uh, in the 18th, early 19th century Europe. And so uh, people would become desperate, absolutely desperate, and then they would invade and conquer their neighbors to to survive. And so uh, so that was important. And uh, here Mises has a real nice summary of this point about the the link between trade and uh, and war, war and peace. He says, in human action, what distinguishes man from animals 
is the insight into the advantages that can be derived from cooperation under the division of labor. Man curbs his innate instinct of aggression in order to cooperate with other human beings. The more he wants to improve his material well-being, the more he must expand the system of the division of labor. Concomitantly, he must more and more restrict, restrict the sphere in which he resorts to military action. Such is the laissez-faire philosophy of Manchester. And uh, well, what he refers to in Manchester is Manchester is there was a school school of thought known as the Manchester School. Ralph Rako mentioned the Manchester School. I gave a talk about this in Manchester, England once. At a, at a university I was at, and then nobody there knew anything about it. In the, at the university, University of Manchester, uh, and how many have heard of the Manchester School? Other, apart from just Ralph Rako mentioning the word, a few people. Okay, well, what this was was uh, in um, in the, the mid 19th century, early to mid 19th century, the British government had protectionist tariffs on uh, food and all sorts of food items, and the laws were called the Corn Laws. Uh, and because um, the law, corn was a sort of a proxy for all ki- kinds of food, wheat and, 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 and so forth, that they had heavy tariffs on, and therefore they re- reduced the uh, availability and increased the price of food to, to the British population. And uh, uh, there were two men named Cobden and Bright that Ralph Rako mentioned. That uh, Ralph Rako mentioned. And this really is a remarkable story, that these two men... Uh, decided that this had to be changed, that they had to move in the direction of free trade because it, it was very obviously uh, harmful to the whole country, even though it was be- benefiting a small handful of, of business people who were isolated from competition. Uh, so it was temporarily benefiting them, these business people anyway. So Cobden and Bright were businessmen. They weren't intellectuals or writers or anything like that. Uh, they took it upon themselves to really learn the case for free trade. And so they learned from Adam Smith and, and David Ricardo and and, uh, and and all others. They knew uh, Bastiat personally. They communicated with Bastiat. And what they did is they started up their own newspaper. They gave speeches everywhere. They published pamphlets in favor of free trade. And, uh, and it became known as the Manchester School because they gathered more and more followers uh, in favor of free trade, and they succeeded in getting in pressuring the British government to end the Corn Laws. So by uh, by the time they, they started in 1837, and uh, within about 10 years they succeeded. They got the, they got the, uh, England by 1850. England abolished uh, all tariffs. It was totally free trade in terms of uh, uh, tariffs, and uh, it's a it's a really uh, inspiring policy or a story because it's just two two men that started the whole thing. In, in a whole in the country of England, okay, and that's that's uh, and Bastiat did something similar. Um, Bastiat was doing almost the same thing in uh, in France in the 1840s. He was uh, he owned the, the family farm, so he inherited the family farm, and he, they paid someone to run the farm. And he was sort of a gentleman scholar. He didn't didn't work per se, and he spent ten years of his life. Uh, educating himself. He, he was just reading everything he could find to, to read and educate himself on everything. Science, economics, and uh, philosophy. And he had, a, he had a close friend. His close friend of his did the same thing. That they, they would, And they would get together occasionally and, and sort of school each other uh, on this. And so he sort of became like a, a monk for ten years or so. And then all of a sudden he had this explosion of writing and speaking. He, uh, he got elected to the National Assembly, and he argued for free trade in the National Assembly. He started up a newspaper again. He went all over France making speeches, and, um, and uh, he wrote several big books. One of them is called Economic Harmonies, which uh, is available online, I, I think, at uh, fee.org. And they also sell all his collected, collected work. And this all happened uh, in about a two- or three-year period, all this publishing act, uh, activity. Uh, he communicated with Cobden and Bright, and he started a free trade movement in France. It wasn't quite as successful before his death as uh, Cobden and Bright were, but he did. But before he died, France was uh, uh, reducing tariffs, and and uh, and so his sort of intellectual descendants after his death in 1850 uh, carried out this this uh, this program, and it it affected uh, other countries of Europe too. Other countries of Europe uh, had had their own Cobden and Brights uh, 
that, that use this information and the model, the political model, to, to succeed. And so it's a really inspiring uh, story about this. And so now the next thing I'd like to do is um, I'll talk a little bit about um, history, the history of trade, the struggle for trade uh, uh, that exists. And at this period, so at this period of time, the, what I'm, that I've been talking about, the mid 1800s, uh, it was sort of the end of the period of uh, mercantilism in Europe. And uh, what well, mercantilism? I'll, I'll read you what uh, Murray Rothbard says about it. His definition, well, one of his definitions of mercantilism. He said, mercantilism, which reached its height in Europe of the 17th and 18th centuries was a system of statism which employed economic fallacy to build up a structure of imperial state power as well as special subsidy and monopolistic privilege to individuals or groups favored by the state. Thus, mercantilism held that exports should be encouraged by the government and imports discouraged. So one of the keys of mercantilism was uh, protectionism because they believed that the source of wealth was the accumulation of uh, precious metals like gold and so when you when you buy something from a foreign country and you pay for it in gold gold leaves the country and therefore the king can't get his paws on it it leaves the country and that's bad so they had that's that's what drove the the, the mercantilist policy of protectionism and uh and so by the, by the time you get to the 1800s, you know, the fact that Britain ended tariffs and France was on the way to reducing tariffs, uh, they had been discarding uh, mercantilism. But uh, this seems to be one of the most powerful uh, motivators in government. I mean, we still have it today. It's, it's sort of the one thing that governments do is cling to mercantilism because that's how politicians stay in power. They, they use the powers of the state to benefit the affluent. Primarily, especially, and who is the affluent? Well, it's always the business class. That's who makes the money. So who has the money? And so, if you want to stay in power for a long time, it's no secret you have to uh, court uh, the people with the money, which are businessmen, business women. And so, you grant them special favors, monopolistic privileges, and so forth, in return for their support to keep you and your party in office. And that seems to be an eternal truth about about government because even though all of these fallacies have been debunked for a long long time uh we still have it well you know what is the bailout of uh, uh of the wall street banksters and uh, and general motors and chrysler but mercantilism it's it's, it's the same thing it's the same exactly that's the system we live under pretty much i i call it um, um fascism it's a half fascism, half socialism. That's my new word for the whole system. I wrote an article on LouRockwell.com on fascism. Uh, and so, the, but uh, you know, intellectuals have always fought this. Uh, the late Milton Friedman once said, uh, uh, "If if because of the efforts of all of the economists in history, tariffs are ten percent lower than they would otherwise be, it would more than paid for." the lifetime income of all those economists, you know, many times over, but because of all the additional wealth that would have been created throughout the world if, 10%, if tariffs were just 10% lower than they otherwise would be because of the case made in favor of free trade by, by economists. And uh, so, well, this, the, among the first to make the case were the French that preceded Bastiat. They were the, the physiocrats. French uh, physiocrats, uh, and uh, and th- these are th- these are the men that Bastiat learned from, among others, among Adam Smith and, and Ricardo. Uh, he learned from the French physiocrats, and um, and one of the uh, better known ones is, uh, is his name is up there in the in the Massey room is uh, Turgot. He was a French finance minister at one point. Uh, if you ever were to visit uh, a Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home in Virginia. Uh, as you walk in the front door, there's a, a big bust of Turgot that uh, is the original bust that he had made of Turgot because he admired, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this is my boy, he admired Turgot so much from his uh, his readings and Jefferson uh, had had a bust made of him, put him in his home right there, right, right at the entrance way <coughs> when, he, when he got in there. And of course, Adam Smith, um, around, you know, a little later after the, the physiocrats, uh, they, the physiocrats were pretty influential from the 1750s to the 1770s. And uh, here's something, uh, the one of them wrote, uh, another one was, this was another one, another French physiocrats. 
Uh, he said this, every man has a natural right to the free exercise of his faculties, provided that he does not employ them to, to the injury of himself and others. And that was his way of stating uh, free, the case for free trade in terms of natural rights. And uh, that's, that's why, that's, of course, another reason why Jefferson uh, found these people so appealing. And one of the interesting uh, points Adam Smith always made was that uh, he held up smugglers as heroes. And a lot of the, a lot of the Americans who signed the Declaration of Independence uh, were affluent businessmen who uh, made money smuggling and, and because getting around trade restrictions. The British government, after, the, after their seven years war, uh, uh, was broke. You know, wars tend to do that. They tend to bankrupt uh, uh, entire governments. And so they looked at their colonies as a source of, 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 um, of wealth to pay off their war debts. And so they, they adopted what were called the Navigation Acts, Trade and Navigation Acts, which was a system of uh, protectionism uh, that was aimed at benefiting the British government at the expense of the colonies. And that's why uh, there were so many smugglers, like John Hancock, the famous, you know, those of you who know the story, the, the, the guy who signed the Declaration of Independence with big letters, John Hancock, uh, well, he, he had made a lot of money smuggling. He was one, one of the most famous smugglers in the, in the New England area. And Adam Smith looked at these men as heroes, Although, ironically, uh, does anyone know how Adam Smith ended his life, what he was doing? What he, was doing? he left the academic world. Uh, he left the University of Glasgow, and, uh, but he still had to live. He had to eat. Uh, anybody ever hear? He was a tariff collector. <laughs> yeah, he was a customs, customs officer. He needed a job. And, so he, and there's even a, a former colleague of mine, uh, Bob Tollison, actually wrote an article in the Journal of Political Economy I think it's called Adam Smith, the tariff collector. And it was, this was, this was about 20 years ago or so in the Journal of Political Economy. If anyone's curious, you can probably find it. If you go online, if in JSTOR, you can probably find that article by Robert Tollison and, and the, some co-author. I forget who his co-author is. He, he has a big long resume with about 10,000 articles and each article has an average of five or six co-authors. I think he's, he's always big on, I don't know, he had a, always had a posse, a research posse, it seemed like, to publish his articles. But um, So you, you could find that one. Okay. Well, after the American Revolution, you know, part of which was motivated by the, the attempt of the British government to, uh, you know, to strangle the colonists uh, economically and uh, with trade laws, taxes, and, and so forth, and, uh, and of course, uh, it wasn't that much of a burden compared to today. I would take it. I would take whatever they were paying in tariffs and, and taxes. But, but they saw the trend as ominous that the, the, the British government was just using them as, as pawns, you know, as, as sort of so many chickens waiting there to be plucked. And so that, that's, that's my interpretation of why it was, even though it was only something like three or four percent, uh, in terms of the taxes they were paying, uh, they knew that it would soon be 13 or 14 percent or, or a lot more. So as far as that goes. But then uh, after this, there's, there's a great book that makes uh, by an American Bastiat, if you will, uh, sort of American version of Bastiat uh, that even it even preceded Bastiat. And it's by a man named John Taylor. And uh, he was known in his, in his time as John Taylor of Caroline. He was from Caroline County, Virginia. And so if you would have look him up, he's found John Taylor of Caroline. He wrote a book called Tyranny Unmasked. Tyranny Unmasked. It was published, I think, in 1820. And it was basically an, an, an ex- expose on against protectionism and, and other things. And, and uh, if you read this in 1820, if any of you have ever studied public choice, you know, I've talked about it, Walter Block has talked about it, but almost anything, any of the main points about the behavior of politics and government that you would learn by studying the field of public choice, you'd read about in this book, Tyranny Unmasked. Uh, the Liberty Fund still publishes it, you, you, so you could buy it if you wanted to. And the language is early 19th century language, so in some parts are kind of hard to follow because of the language. It's not our uh, modern English. Uh, but it's, it's, I think it's just incredible that... Um, he was able to put together the knowledge of his day about economics and politics and write this book um, yeah, on it. And so he was sort of like an American Bastiat before Bastiat came around. And, and in the introduction to the book, the man who wrote the introduction to the book uh, for the Liberty Fund said this. He said, um, 
<clears throat> there has always been a collection of men in America who wanted to bring the British mercantilist system here precisely because it was destructive of freedom. They figured to be the commanders of the system and its chief beneficiaries. These men included Alexander Hamilton and the Federalists and later the politicians of the era of good feelings in the 1820s who eventually became the Whigs. And so they had this revolution that was fought in part. One of the reasons was the trade restrictions. If you read the Declaration of Independence, there's a, a, a list of uh, 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 condemnations where Jefferson, a big long list of them. What are we condemning the King of England, King of Great Britain for? And, and one of them was he has, he has um, uh, restricted our ports. He has, he has restricted our trade with the rest of the world. Uh, it's right in there. And so uh, when it's, it's over, though, these men uh, and the, the author of this um, introduction to the book says, well, this included Hamilton, the Federalists, and then the Whigs, and then it later was the Republicans. After the Whigs died off in the 1850s, the Republican Party picked up the mantle of protectionism. So they always wanted to bring British mercantilism to America as long as they could be in charge of it. Because after all, they wanted to be the king of Great Britain. Uh, they wanted to be the kings of Great Britain, the ones, the beneficiaries of this system that uh, Murray Rothbard uh, defined so clearly in that quotation that, that, I, that I mentioned to you. And so, and here's another thing that um, Taylor himself says about protectionism of his time. No equal mode of enriching the party of government and impoverishing the party of the people has ever been discovered than, than protectionism. And, uh, and so he made a great case for free trade. And it was certainly necessary because th these people were busy as beavers trying to get trade, uh, trade restrictions imposed on America to do, like I said, uh, uh, do to, uh, to ourselves in peacetime what our enemies would do to us in wartime uh, because there's money in it. There's money in it. And the first success they had in the United States uh, really was uh, something called the Tariff of Abominations in 1828. Um, this was called the Tariff of, of Abominations by Southerners, mostly in the United States. Uh, the people in New England thought it as the, the uh, probably the, the tariff of let the good times roll, because they, they were the manufacturers who were being protected from competition by this tariff. And it was about a 45% average tariff, on average, 45%. That means there were some things like uh, woolen blankets, for example, that were imported from England. There was a 200% tax on them when it came to the ports in the United States. And so, uh, and so, uh, so that the New England woolen blanket manufacturers could, could thrive. That, that, that would have been a prohibitive tariff. That would have, that was so high that, you know, some tariffs were, in those days were called revenue tariffs. They were modest, 10%, something 15% only used to raise enough revenue to finance the constitutional functions of government. But when they get up to be 45%, 50%, that's a protective tariff because the purpose is not just to raise the the amount of money to fund the government, but to keep out competition. So the, in these days, they distinguish between a, a, a revenue tariff and a protective tariff. And the, we still do today. I mean, they still do if you study international trade. Uh, you'll, you'll learn that, you know, at some point a tariff rate becomes protective. Because if it's just a, you know, minor 10% tax, it's not going to keep imports out much. Uh, uh, foreign manufacturers can always cut their cost by 10% in response, for example, and still compete as far as that goes. Okay. So, uh, we had this tariff abominations in the, the state of South Carolina, uh, um, uh, nullified it. They held a political convention and they issued a proclamation that we're not going to collect this tariff at Charleston Harbor, uh, which was one of the main harbors in America at the time. Uh, you know, Boston, New York, uh, uh, Charleston, and New Orleans were the big, big ports in the United States at the time. And so uh, they even allocated this. The South Carolina legislature allocated two hundred thousand dollars in in 1828 to the governor for the purchase of firearms. Uh, with which uh, they would use against tax collectors. If anybody tried to come down or if they tried to send a small army down to enforce the tariff of abominations, uh, they, they bought two, they had $200,000 set aside to purchase guns. You could probably buy a lot of guns for 200 grand in, uh, in 1828, as far as that goes. So they were serious. They were really deadly serious about this. They considered it unconstitutional, among other things, because, uh, 
it was obviously a, a tool of plunder. I mean, uh, there, there was very little manufacturing in the South, uh, and these were all these were almost entirely not 100 percent, but they were mo- almost entirely tariffs on manufacturing, the farm tools, blankets, shoes, things that uh, they bought in the South from either northern manufacturers or European manufacturers. Either way, they're they were paying more in the, and, and were getting no benefits at all from this. Because all the benefits were, were in the north, so they, uh, that's why they called it the tariff abominations. And they forced the government to back down. There was a, this went on for about five or six years, and they forced uh, Andrew Jackson, who was president of the United States at the time, to uh, and uh, to back down. And uh, and the U.S. Congress, uh, which was, this was all led by Henry Clay. This was the work of Henry Clay. Henry Clay was a hemp farmer from Kentucky. And in his day, he was known as the Prince of Hemp because uh, he wanted these tariffs to to block the importation of hemp from other countries. Uh, he was a hemp farmer. And in fact, he once said, I quote him in one of my books, as saying that's why he got into politics, to get a high tariff on hemp, to keep out competition. So he was a, he was a crook from the very beginning, uh, Henry Clay. It's, yeah, what a motivation. I want to rip off my neighbors. That's that's why I'm going to get into politics. I mean, and usually they don't admit it. They'll say something uh, the, uh, for the good of mankind. My <laughs> my friends have urged me to run for office or something like that. <laughs> uh, not that I want to break into their home and steal their television set or something like that. Uh, so so they did negotiate it down, and. Uh, and it's kind of a funny story. Henry Clay, his whole career, uh, this was the, one of the big things, trying to get the, the tariff of abominations reinstated. And so uh, they thought they were going to do it in 1840 uh, because they elected a member of Henry Clay's party president, a Whig. Uh, in fact, they, and this is Lou Rockwell's favorite president, William Henry Harrison. He was, they, so they, can, they, had, they were powerful in the Congress, the Whig party. Henry Clay was their leader, and they had the president. You know, it's like the Obama administration. The party controlled everything. But uh, uh, the reason why William Henry Harrison is uh, Lou Rockwell's favorite president, and mine, my favorite president, is he died one month after he took office. <laughs> and uh, he died of pneumonia. He, he didn't wear a hat on Inauguration Day. It was very bitterly cold, and he caught pneumonia and died. And so, uh, uh, but and then his, his successor was John Tyler, who was a free trader. And so uh, Henry Clay and the Whigs uh, kicked John Tyler out of their party and burned him in effigy in front of the White House. It was like one big infantile tantrum on the part of Henry Clay because their whole agenda, they wanted high protectionist tariffs to finance corporate welfare for, for the railroad companies and uh, who funded the, their party and, um, and, and a central bank. They wanted to bring back the Bank of the United States and uh, they thought William Henry Harrison would be their man, but then he kicked the bucket. And so that's one of these uh, 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 Adam Smith's invisible hand strikes again, I think. <laughs> knocked, knocked off at William Henry Harrison. And uh, so they didn't succeed there in, in, in doing this. And so, uh, and as a result, the free traders uh, had the upper hand so that when you get to so that was 1840 when this happened. 1841, actually, was when he died. He was inaugurated in uh, uh, March of 1841, died uh, April 1841. Uh, but by the time you get to 1857, there's a history of tariff history of the United States written by Frank Talsig. Uh, which is, it's online at Mises.org, and it goes up to... Uh, early 20th century, but um, if you're interested in that. And he says in that book that um, the tariffs were as low as they would ever be in the 19th century by 1857. The average tariff rate had been pushed down to about 15%, and everyone considered that to be a revenue tariff. And and at that time, the tariff accounted for at least 90% of all federal tax revenue. There was no income tax until uh, 1913. There was an income tax during the Civil War, but it was ended in 1872 in the United States. Then it was well, but it wasn't resurrected until 1913. And so this was the the high point of free trade, 1857, according to Frank Talsig. And then his name is spelled T-A-U-S-S-I-G. Frank. And the whole book is online at Mises.org. And I think I think Jeff reproduced it too. I think you could buy it downstairs if you, if you wanted to. It's a it's a real classic. Uh, but um, but then the old Henry Clay Whigs made a comeback. 
Uh, Henry Clay was dead by now, as was the Whig Party. By, by 1855, the Whig Party imploded because it didn't succeed. After all, this was the party that was funded by the railroad corporations and the, and the New York City banks and the advocates of central banking, the advocates of protectionism, and the adv- advocates of corporate welfare for, for road building and railroad companies. And they failed. They, they almost succeeded in 1840, but they gave them another 15 years uh, and they didn't come through. Uh, and so the, the, the money behind the Whig Party disappeared and, the, and the, the party disappeared. But it was replaced by the Republican Party. The same cabal of businessmen and bankers and, and people that created an, uh, were involved in the creation of the Republican Party. And so they picked up this mantle of protectionism. And, and they had some success. There was a, a, a depression in 1859. Uh, 1858, 59, and they used that as an occasion to make the case for protectionism as a response to the depression. That, and they succeeded. So in the 1859-60 session of, um, of the U.S. Congress, they passed a, a tariff that was known as the Moral Tariff, named after a, a Vermont steel manufacturer named Justin Morrill. M O R R I L L, and uh, and so that that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Why Mr. Morrill wanted a tariff on steel <laughs> to keep out foreign steel, and so and this is before the Civil War. This is before Abraham Lincoln was elected president. This is before any of the Southern states uh, seceded uh, over over uh, you know to to sort of set the stage for the Civil War. And, uh, and this, this tariff was passed by the House of Representatives in, during the 1859-1860 session. And then it became, it was passed by the Senate later. And then it was signed into law two days before Abraham Lincoln was um, inaugurated as president. That was uh, March 2nd, 1861 was uh, inauguration day. I think, or March, yeah, March, March 4th was inauguration day. March 2nd was the, the tariff, uh, uh, was signed by, uh, uh, President James Buchanan. Okay, and so uh, the protection of these men that uh, the uh, you know I quoted this book by John Taylor, where the introduction said there's always been a group of men who wanted to bring the British mercantilist system to America. Well, now this is who they were. This was Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party. Now it was started out as the so there's this link between the Federalists of Alexander Hamilton, who became the Whigs who essentially became the Republicans to carry the torch of, of uh, mercantilism, the political torch of mercantilism. And so uh, as those of you who have read any of my Lincoln writings, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, is infuriated my critics the most and, and the, the people I call the Lincoln cult in America is I write about what Lincoln actually said in his first inaugural address. Uh, they like to quote his second inaugural address constantly because Lincoln quotes the Bible in it a lot. And he blamed the Civil War on God, uh, saying, don't look at me. I had nothing to do with that. This is my interpretation of the second inaugural address. I had nothing to do with it. God did it. Uh, but the first inaugural address, very, very different. Very different. First thing he says is, if you read any of my speeches, uh, you'll know that I have no intent to do anything about southern slavery and even if I did it would be unconstitutional to do so he pledged his support for a constitutional amendment that would have pro- prohibited the federal government from ever interfering in southern slavery uh, and you could read it in his first inaugural address and near the end last couple of paragraphs and not only that but this amendment was his idea uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin the, um, the, who wrote this big thousand page book on Lincoln a couple of years ago called Team of Rivals tells the whole story of how when Lincoln was elected he, uh, he, he instructed William Seward, who would be, he was a senator from New York, who would become his secretary of state to get this amendment passed through the Senate that would, that would prohibit the federal government from interfering in slavery. In other words, it would have enshrined slavery explicitly in the Constitution for the first time. It, slavery had only been mentioned peripherally in the Constitution. It was, it, by, it was something called the three-fifths clause. But, but Lincoln, uh, ordered, instructed his, Soon to be a Secretary of State to put it right in there, and the word get an amendment. And the amendment passed the House and the Senate uh, before Lincoln was inaugurated. So they were they were going to do this, and so in the same speech, though, here's what he says about tariffs. He says, you know, and keep in mind the tariff rate had gone from 
15%. Now, at that point, it was 33%, roughly 32.6, and I call it 33%. So it more than doubled two days before Lincoln takes office. And, and this was took in 90 to 95% of all federal tax revenue. And in the first inaugural address, which everyone, anyone can read, uh, he said, it is my duty to collect the duties and imposts, okay? Duties and imposts, tariffs. And he says, but beyond that, there will be no invasion of any state, okay? Those were his exact words I had memorized. There will be no invasion of any state. Now, why would a president of the United States be threatening an invasion, a military invasion? You know what that means. That means death, uh, death and destruction, a military invasion of his own country. You know, why would he do that? Because a sentence before that, he said there needs to be no bloodshed. And so the question is, well, why would the president of the United States be threatening bloodshed of his own people? Why? Well, he said it in the next sentence. He said uh, there will be no invasion uh, as long as I can collect the duties and imposts. So he literally threatened a war over tax collection. And, of course, he kept his word. Uh, When the southern states seceded, they didn't intend to start sending checks to Washington, D.C., you know, tax money. They, they weren't going to collect money at Charleston Harbor and send the money to Abe Lincoln in Washington, D.C., you know, any more than they would send the money to England or France. And so, uh, you know, just read it yourself. You know, it's right there in black and white. It's uh, threatened a war over taxation uh, and, uh, and then kept his word uh, on taxation. And that's why, uh, as I said, my, my critics, as I say, they just hate it when I bring this up because it's... Uh, I, don't, there's, I don't think you can argue against this. In any other. There's, not, there's no argument against This is what happened. You know, it's, um, when a politician's actions m- match his words, you know he's not lying. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, so, and so that's why, uh, you know, any, if you study any politician, whether it's Bill Clinton or Abe Lincoln, uh, you know, read the speeches, nothing wrong with that. But actions speak louder. So if they promise something in a speech and they don't do it, you know they're lying uh, as far as that goes. So so that's where we were in the Civil War. And so the tariff rate during the Civil War went up to about 47%. It went from 15 to 32.6, then to about 45. And it remained at 45% on average, as the average uh, tariff, for, for many decades, decades, all up into the 20th century. So the war was over in 1865, but but the but for example, the tariff of 1897 in the United States, the average tariff rate was 57 percent, 57 percent. Today it's like under two percent tariffs, average tariff rate. In uh, the date was uh, 1897. By the year 1897, so you're getting you know, the 20th century, the eve of the 20th century. The average tariff rate was 57%. And, and one of the things this did was uh, the farmers, American farmers from the South, the Midwest, wherever their farmers were really being screwed by this tariff because what it did was it dried up uh, their, uh, their international customers. It, uh, it uh, harmed their internet. Because after all, the whole purpose of a 50%, 57% average tariff is to reduce imports from abroad and so if, say, people from England have a, a severely reduced level of, uh, of exports to America, they have a lot less money. And what were they doing with that money, the British? What were the British people doing with this money that they were earning by selling their goods to Americans? Well, they were spending a lot of it on American agricultural products. Uh, and the United States at this time was a huge exporter of food. And so if you, uh, that's why there's a saying in economics that a tax on imports is also a tax on exports because of this effect. Uh, you put a tax on imports, if it's big enough, it impoverishes our trading partners who have less ability to buy our exports. So it is indirectly a tax on exports. The Constitution, the United States Constitution, uh, uh, outlaws an explicit tax on exports. But this is an impl- uh, a tax on imports is an implicit tax on exports as well. And so the farmers, even without studying economics, understood this because every time they saw that tariff rate go up, they saw their, their bank accounts go down and, and their customers in, in Europe disappear. Uh, and so they became a potent lobbying force uh, 
for some alternative form of taxation. Uh, because still by 1897, the tariff was still the principal form of revenue. There were, there were excise taxes also, but tariffs and excise taxes was, was the main source of revenue for the federal government. And so the farmers are saying, we're getting killed by this. It's, it's, you know, and, and it was grossly unfair for the farmers to be bearing the burden, the, you know, such a big burden of, uh, of taxation that was supposedly to be funding uh, things that benefit the whole country, you know, the constitutional functions of the, of the government. And so they became a potent lobbying force for an income tax. And, uh, and, a, and a deal was struck. The farmers, in their, through their political organizations, uh, said uh, basically, uh, you know, we will organize the farm people of the country uh, in favor of an income tax if you reduce the tariff. So the government did. The, the tariff declined by 1913, which was the year the income tax came in, became the uh, 16th Amendment of the Constitution. The average tariff rate had been dropped to 29%. And so that was the deal. The, the average tariff rate went from 57% in 1897 to just 16 years later, 29%. That's a pretty big cut. And the farmers organized, uh, and at this time, uh, well, they, uh, the farmers, by that time, by the turn of the 20th century, uh, the percentage of the labor force in farming was still pretty substantial. I think it was probably around 20 to 30 percent of the labor force was involved some way in agriculture, but they had a lot of money too. You know, money is a input into politics, not just numbers. And so they were pretty influential in this. And then, uh, uh the, when the income tax first came in, the top rate, I believe, was 7%, but you had to be, I think you had to make a half million dollars a year to pay 7%. So it was, it was only on the Ted Kennedys of the world that the income tax was intended to be. But by the time you get to 1920, uh, World War I, uh, it was 70%. It was 70% because of World War I. And then after the war, of course it went down, but it didn't go down to 7%. It, it stayed higher forever. And, and what also happened, there was a bait and switch with the farmers. The farmers said, okay, finally, after 60 years of being really, really unfairly uh, targeted with uh, this, this plunderous uh, tariff ever since the end of the Civil War, uh, for, for all these, and before the, you know, periods before the Civil War, uh, they finally thought this was more fair, that we have an income tax. And so, but, but what happened was, uh, by 1929, by 1929, the average tariff rate was back up to 59.1%. So, and by that time, the income tax rate was much higher also. And you didn't have to make a half a million dollars to, to be in the top bracket again. So it was one big bait and switch. The farmers ended up with high, a high, the same old high tariff. And on top of that, they, like everybody else in the country, was burdened with an income tax now. At the same time, so that's so the, the government really played the farmers uh, with this with this this deal, and, uh, and that was the old bait and switch. And of course, the uh, that 59.1 percent average tariff of 1929, that's that was the famous what I call the Smoot Hawley yes, Hawley Hoover tariff. Because Herbert Hoover was the president and he signed it. I don't know why they call it the Smoot Hawley tariff. I mean, it was, it was Herbert Hoover who signed it. Uh, Smoot and Hawley were the two sponsors in the Congress. And, uh, for some reason, uh, Herbert Hoover is left off the hook with this. But the Smoot Hawley Hoover tariff, uh, spawned an international trade war. And there's an old MIT economist. I don't know. He's probably not alive anymore. His name is Charles Kindleberger. Because he was, he was an old guy when I was an undergraduate, but who knows, he might be still kicking. I don't know, I haven't heard from him, of him in a long time, but he published, uh, you know, a classic international trade textbook for decades. It was like the top selling international trade textbook in economics, and he had this uh, really interesting graph in there explaining how in three years, from 29 to 32, world trade diminished by two thirds, the total volume of trade. Now, if you think of what I said at the beginning of this lecture about how Trade uh, is, is sort of the source of civilization and the division of labor and, and the prosperity and so forth. A two-thirds reduction in world trade in three years was a, quite a shock. And that surely contributed to uh, why we had a Great Depression. I don't think no one, no one would argue that this is the cause of the Great Depression. 
certainly not here, but it certainly didn't help to, to diminish world trade by two thirds. And, and Kindleberger had, he has some kind of pictures. He has like a picture of the world trade, and he has, he has all kind of links between England and France and all this, and then then the, there's the second picture. It looks about, you know, it's like this size, all the links between all the different countries. And it's, I, I can't remember exactly what it looks like. So I, I should have gone and looked for his book and uh, handed it out because it's a, kind of a neat explanation of what happened. And so that was quite a catastrophe. And uh, as a result, uh, the Roosevelt administration <coughs> began the long process of reducing tariff rates. The world average tariff rates in the United States was 59%. Other countries retaliated with huge tariffs, but uh, they rec- they recognized what a disaster this was. And so uh, and so uh, one of the good things that FDR actually did was he got the ball rolling on international negotiations to reduce these world tariff rates because of this stupid and uh, destructive uh, tariff war that 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 had gone on and this went on forever. This was it, it became the general agreement on tariffs and trade. For every several years, all the trading countries of the world will get together and try to negotiate down tariff rates, which they did, but it took, you know, it took like 50 years to undo the damage done by the Smoot Holly Hoover tariff because, uh, GATT, it used to be called GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and, uh, but some people say that it really stood for General Agreement to Talk and Talk <laughs> because they, they, they would, each round of trade talks would last eight years. They, you know, no one wanted to give up their 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 protection of you know of of corn or soybeans or whatever. So, but it did it did uh, diminish tariffs. You know, the average world tariffs did go down decade after decade on average. They went they went down. And so, well, the final thing I'll say is that I have one more quote from Murray Rothbard about this. He said, uh, "The impetus for protectionism comes not from preposterous theories." but from the quest for coerced special privilege and restraint of trade at the expense of efficient competitors and consumers. In the host of special interests, using the political process to repress and loot the rest of us, the protectionists are among the most venerable. It is high time that we get them once and for all off our backs and treat them with the righteous indignation they so richly deserve. So you know, Murray Rothbard never pulled too many punches when, that, when he wrote that. If, uh, and so um, I think we'll end for there. I have a, about two minutes if anybody wants to ask a question. Um, um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll call. Uh, you're all you're all kind of hung over from being at the karaoke last mm-hmm. night, I guess. So, oh yes, we had a, a man in the back. Uh, I think it is uh, the, to be sure because you know Lincoln uh, 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 promised an invasion over tariffs. Read his first inaugural address. If you Google uh, Jefferson Davis's first inaugural address. He makes a big deal about tariffs also. So, uh, you know, what are we to believe? We had the President of the United States and the President of the Confederate States in their first inaugural addresses opposing and defending tariff and Lincoln threatening an invasion of tariff and Jefferson Davis saying we only want to be left alone and trade with the rest of the world. Uh, uh, he, he made it, he highlighted it in his first inaugural. And so, uh, of course, I don't see how you could get around. I, I've, I've never argued that it was the only cause of the, of the Civil War, but it certainly had, it was a cause of the war. How else could you interpret what Lincoln said? Because he 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 kept his word. And then once the war began, uh, no historian, by the way, would say that Lincoln invaded the South to free the slaves. Slavery became an issue two years into the war. But uh, the initial invasion had nothing to do with, because there were some of Lincoln's commanders. Uh, there was uh, in, in Georgia and Missouri who uh, were out there the first year of the war who issued proclamations, uh, emancipation proclamations in that area where they had control, where the army was. And Lincoln fired them. He, uh, the one was named John Fremont. He, he, he stripped them of his command. And so they had the ability to that literally free thousands of slaves in the first year of the war in Georgia and, and, uh, and Missouri. And uh, Lincoln vetoed that. But it changed. You know, the later on the war it changed. But so, so no historian would say that the reason the invasion took place was to free the slaves because they didn't. Uh, they didn't. They had a chance. They didn't do it. But Lincoln did say, I, uh, uh, I need my taxes uh, and you're not paying them and we're going to force you to pay them. And he and he kept his word. He kept his word. So yeah, that was a 
you know, what was that? Coconut fell out of the palm tree up upstairs, uh, I guess. So yeah, that's that's the cause of the war. That's how else would you interpret those speeches and the, the actions? But yes, sir, you had your hand up. Uh, one comment and a question. Uh, earlier this year, even before, yeah. and he finally came to quite come out and say that that's what it was, but it's hard to it. Yeah, Pat, Pat is kind of schizophrenic on this. Yeah. <laughs> he he wrote a whole he wrote a book several, one of his books several years ago, and he sent me the manuscript before it was published to comment on his chapter on this, the, the Civil War chapter and the tariff and all that. And he, of course, is a big protectionist. He, he's, he's a critic of Lincoln, but he's a protectionist, so he's conflicted. His, his hero was the all-time biggest protectionist of all the American presidents. No one was a bigger champion of protectionism than, than Lincoln. In fact, in, in my book, Lincoln Unmasked, I tell the whole story of how he got the nomination. By uh, uh, the, the key to getting the nomination was the Pennsylvania delegation. He he, uh, Seward eventually gave him the New York delegation. He had a lot of votes at the Republican Convention of 1860. But Lincoln himself, who was a political genius, yeah, I call him uh, Bill Clinton times 10,000. Uh, and, and Murray, he was a master politician, but Murray Rothbard defined a master politician as a masterful liar, conniver, and manipulator. But what Lincoln did was he sent his friend, Judge David Davis, with all of the uh, original copies of his speeches in favor of protectionism to explain to the Pennsylvania politicians, I'm your man, this is your man. And they believed it, and that's how he got, the, that's how he got in.